Um, are you are you alive, Jess? <laughs> I, I am alive. I don't Perfect. know if I'm alive, but I, I am alive. And I you think we're alive. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, welcome everyone, um, <clears throat> whoever is watching. Um, and um, you know, um, so Jess and I, Jess uh, Saville and and uh, and I, we decided we wanted to do some live video chatting and answer questions. Um, and maybe make this a kind of like a regular thing. <clears throat> so here's number one, um, the first iteration of it. Um, and um, we thought, you know, a good topic to start off with um, would be, um, is the question, is a um, kidney safe or kidney, whatever, beneficial diet and, and lifestyle um, affordable? You know, we always talk about you know, what people should do and what they shouldn't do and what they should eat and what they shouldn't eat. And oftentimes, um, you know, everybody has a budget um, and um, people need to know what is even possible. What can I do? <clears throat> um, and um, you know, so I've heard many people saying, whoa, I can't afford this, you know forget about it, you know, I'm not even gonna try. So maybe we can debunk some myths um, and help people with some real life ideas. What do you think, Jess? Yeah, this is a common question that comes up all the time. I mean, I think every single patient conference we've come to, like, does it cost more if I do this with inflation and, you know, some of the financial strains that people are feeling, can I really eat this way and fit in like fit within my budget still. And I mean, the answer is totally yes. <laughs> so, but there's some tips and tricks that we can share with you. Um, I think Thomas and I have both uh, utilized a ketogenic diet in our life personally. And so like, and I have small children and I'll like a lot of people to please. And so I can speak to that as well. And you know, how we worked with it in our budget as well. Super, excellent. Maybe we should say real quick who we even are. So um, I can start. <laughs> uh, so my name is Thomas Wimes. Um, I'm a, a professor at the University of California in Santa Barbara. <clears throat> and um, I direct a research lab um, that has been focused on uh, investigating polycystic kidney disease for 20 plus years. Um, and um, in my um, <clears throat> you know night and weekend job, if you will, um, I'm also the founder and uh, president of Santa Barbara Nutrients. Uh, so it's a startup company um, coming out of UC Santa Barbara, where um, you know we're trying to take things to the next level um, and um, try to come up with um, creative, uh, beneficial um, products for um, starting out with polycystic kidney disease, but um, really for kidney health in general. Um, and, you know, I'm really lucky um, that um, Jess and I um, have been working together for, you know, a couple of years and, and created um, some fantastic, um, like a fantastic dietary program, the Renew program um, that Jess is really leading um, the efforts on. Um, yeah. All right. I bounce it over to you. Who are you, Jess? <laughs> So I'm a renal dietitian by training, been working in the kidney realm for a long, long time. Um, I have two organizations, uh, Kidney Nutrition Institute, where we work on advancing the therapies and we work with patients one-on-one -on -one and we train other dietitians. And uh, then also our nonprofit, Renaline, where we run the Renew program through. And both of those have separate purposes, but overall, one of our goals is to make sure that nutrition is a first line uh, the first line therapy, the first line avenue when you're looking at kidney health. And so, you know, I think Thomas and I have both been aligned on that piece is that there's more that can be done. And the more that we try and put effort into it and look at how it works with uh, people, the more, the, the better answers that we get to really figure out, you know, what is like the ultimate strategy and the, and how do we make this really precise for people? Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Yeah, and so the Renew program, and maybe I'm not sure how this works, but maybe we can put a link later on uh, in, into the description so people can find it. Um, so the Renew program has been <clears throat> up and running since um, January this year. And I think over 100 people have gone through it. And uh, I would say, you know, lots and lots of people have gotten huge benefits and, and you know, uh, are raving about it. Um, but um, so, and this is maybe, if you will, the, you know, the deluxe version of how <clears throat> somebody can learn 
um, these dietary and lifestyle changes um, that we have been, you know, coming up with, um, with lots of help from, um, you know, very experienced renal dietitians, <clears throat> with lots of um, kind of educational materials, um, digital help, and so on. Um, so if somebody is lost in space um, and doesn't know what to do and gets all kinds of, you know, conflicting um information from the internets and, and various doctors and they're all saying different things um, and you're all confused, I really, really highly recommend to look into the Renew program and see if you could, um, you know, can participate. Um, it's a three-month program plus a one-month onboarding. So there's a bit of a time commitment um, and it's almost, I was, so, you know, I'm a college professor. <clears throat> I always think of this in terms of, you know, it's just like taking a college class, right? So you're you book the class, you know, the instructor is there, there's, you know, your fellow students are in it. Um, and, you know, uh, but you also have to pay tuition uh, because, you know, the, um, the instructor has to be paid. Um, and um, maybe let's talk about this real quick. Um, so what is the, um, the tuition, if you will, of the Renew program? And, um, and is this for-profit? Is this non-profit? What are we talking about? Yeah, this is really good. So. Uh, for the Renew program itself, it's $1,500 per participant to come in. We run it through our nonprofit. So every single penny that we have utilized as people have come in, it has gone into, you know, paying the dietitians who run the program. That's really important, obviously, and, you know, how we fund the program. But it goes back into redevelopment of the program, like sending the dietitian to Metabolic Health Summit so that she can share about this and be able to connect and learn more things. And, you know, so we're really proud of how we have used that money and our hope as a nonprofit, which is why we housed it there in particular, is especially moving into 2023 that we can focus on that grant funding and being able to find private donors that can sponsor scholarships for people and collaborating with organizations where uh, that nonprofit structure is helpful for them um, on tax write off. So, uh, the goal I mean, right now, people pay to come in. We have a wait list of people that uh, need a scholarship, and that's definitely one of our goals this year. And we're just, we're so grateful when people come in and they can participate and be able to help fund some of that progress moving forward. So, I always say, like, people get a personal benefit when they come in to renew, but honestly, every dollar ends up paying forward to all people with PKD because this is a new therapy. And if anybody has been in the medical environment at all, change is really slow to happen. And so to take some cutting edge information and put it into direct application and then keep moving that forward so we can find the right, right answers that that takes people trying things out and clinicians understanding what's happening and what works and what doesn't work. And so um, anyways, I, I feel like everyone that comes in to renew, they are their own pioneer for PKD. And it helps us so much as clinicians to, to figure that out. So mm -hmm. great. <clears throat> Excellent. Yeah. So renew is a nonprofit um, mm -hmm. endeavor. Um, so this is not meant to you know make a big buck or anything like that. Um, yeah. And um, you know, I, I think one can think about of it just as, you know, you, you're in college, you take a college class, um, you know, you have to pay tuition for it. Um, good. Okay. But what about, you know, I mean, there are lots of people for whom $1,500 is a lot of money, <clears throat> understandably. And, you know, they cannot afford it um, and they want to do it on their own, <clears throat> right? So um, nothing wrong with that. Um so maybe we can talk about what um, it might take um, to kind of implement a, um, a kidney beneficial diet um, and what it might cost, uh, if anything. Um, and does it actually cost more than the standard American diet? You know, the SAD is a sad diet, <laughs> uh, aptly named um, sad diet. Um, let me pull up a little thing here. Um, <clears throat> Well, and one thing just while you're pulling that up, uh, you don't have to, um, we feel as dietitians, and I think we'll learn more and more how to get precise on this. You don't have to do everything at once to get a benefit. I think mm. uh, for some pers like some personalities, like if I don't do everything, then like there's no point in doing something. 
but always doing something. It either helps create momentum to move on to the next thing, but I think there's a lot of things you can do that are kidney preservative that aren't ketogenic, that are maybe a little bit more simple than adopting that little, that more difficult approach. And mm -hmm. those are some of the things we can go through. So even if you pick one thing, you're like, oh, I can do that. Like, that's not so hard for me. Like I can adopt this one piece. Like just, you just start there. And those things I 150% think still make a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent point. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and in fact, um, let's see, am I sharing anything? There we go. All right. <clears throat> um, so, you know, um, so, all right, let me just first um, help everyone navigate what, what I'm trying to show here. So this is just the Santa Barbara Nutrients website. And if you go to up here, PKD Toolkit, and then the first thing down here um, called Diet and Lifestyle for PKD, click on that, <clears throat> brings you to this page, um, which has this kind of downloadable, printable PDF file with um, our diet and lifestyle recommendations that we just put together. And there's an English version, there's a Chinese version, German version, Spanish version, so pick your favorite language. Um, there's also a video down here that kind of goes through um, everything. But let me just click on this and it just pulls up the English version. All right, here we go. So, and let's only use this as a kind of like a visual so we, you know, have something we talk about. And maybe the first thing to say is, you know, if somebody, let's say, pulls this up and they say, whoa, there's like eight steps and I have to do all these things. And they will say, no way I can do this. It's too much work. This is going to occupy my entire life, which is um, exactly what you just said here, Jess, and that. Um, no, you don't have to do all of these things all at once, right? So um, that's why they're actually steps. You know, you pick something and you do it uh, and you, you try to implement it. And once you've gotten used to it and this becomes part of your, you know, lifestyle change, start on, on the next thing and so on. So um, it's not necessary to do all these things all at once or even at all, you know, try to improve um, wherever you can. And uh, let's just maybe go down the list. So the first one, maybe I'll just say a couple of things on it because that has to do with the, um, you know, keto citra, um, which is this medical food um, that <clears throat> you know, Center of Our Nutrients has come up with um, for the dietary management of polycystic kidney disease or individuals with polycystic kidney disease. And um, it's just listed here as step one because I, I always think Maybe that could be the first thing to do um, because that's the easiest thing to do. And um, if you look up here on the left, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow. Um, uh, can you see my arrow, Jess? Do you see it? Yeah, that's okay, good. perfect. Yeah. So if you see um, on the left, um, we've put a little scale here so from hard to easy. <clears throat> so I would say taking keto citra is the easiest thing you could possibly do because all you have to do is, you know, drink. Um, you know, drink um, a lemonade, drink twice a day. That's it. Um, so couldn't be any easier. Anyone can do it. Um, but then the next scale is the expensive versus, you know, saves money versus neutral in the middle scale. And clearly, you know, this leans more towards the expensive because, you know, it costs money. Um, so it's super easy to do, um, but not the, you know, it doesn't save you money. <clears throat> um, uh, However, I think easy is, is actually good <laughs> um, because, you know, chances are you're not going to fall off the wagon there. So let's talk about all the other things <clears throat> which I think can actually end up saving a lot of money um, at the end of the day. So let's go to number two, drink enough water. And um, maybe Jess can chime in. Um, how much water would you say people should drink, you know, someone with PKD? I uh, usually aim for about three liters and sometimes a little bit more, but it depends on the person. We've had some people do a little bit less because they're feeling kind of cruddy on that. But, you know, three liters is a good, you know, mm -hmm. aim to shoot for. Perfect. That's yeah. what it says here also. However, um, I think that's really dependent on the stage of kidney diseases that someone is in. So usually for mild to moderate stages, you know, stage one to three, I think three liters is probably what most doctors would say, you know, is a good goal. Um, if someone is a more advanced stage, things totally change, right? So it's not right, Jess? 
then people need to potentially drink. Yeah, alcohol. I mean, it, it just depends on the person for sure. A lot of people still are drinking a lot at the later stages. So unless you're having fluid retention or, you right. know, other problems and that may be, that may be modified. Um, but that's something that you and your doctor would look at. And a lot of times we look at, mm -hmm. you know, like their sodium levels in the blood to make sure people aren't too dilute. Cause I mean, you really don't feel good that way. Yeah. Right. Okay, good. Yeah. So definitely talk to your doctor, get a number, a goal from your doctor. And uh, let's say, you know, your doctor says, okay, shoot for three liters of water per day. Um, here's a trick. Um, you want to drink water, right? You don't want to drink sodas or fruit juices or anything with sugar. Um, and I think the typical American drinks a lot of these things. You know, you you know, go to the grocery store, you buy your orange juice and your apple juice and your Coca-Cola and your whatever it is. Um, so if you cut that out, um, I bet that lots of people would actually save a lot of money um, and instead just drink um, drink water. And that's why on the scale here, you know, the, the needle tilts more towards saves money. So it's actually better than neutral. I think for for the average American, um, just switching from, you know, all these sodas and juices to water um, saves money. Would you agree maybe, Jess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're not uh, purchasing uh, your fluid, <laughs> then it can save a lot of money right? Uh, for sure. And, you know, a lot of people also worry a little bit about their drinking water, maybe from their tap and sometimes doing a one time investment in a filter or an ROS mm -hmm. system can be a really good way to save money in the long term. If you're buying a lot of bottled water, because you're mm -hmm. not sure on the salt content in your, you know, your city water or whatever. That's actually a great point. Uh, I was going to also mention that. Um, so where I live, <clears throat> I think we have clean water and safe water, but it tastes just horrible. And it comes out of these um, reservoirs in the hills up there, and it just tastes ugh, terrible. If you make coffee with it, you know, you can throw away your coffee. It doesn't just taste good at all. So, you know, in my house, we were actually used to just going to the water store, buying these you know, big, giant bottles of water all the time, which is a hassle and um, just no good. So our neighbor recommended, hey, why don't you get one of these um, under the counter, you know, under the sink reverse osmosis filters. So which I didn't know at that time that those exist and I looked into it. They cost like 200 bucks or so. And it was really a game changer for us. Um, so, you know, you buy those on Amazon, you install it <clears throat> and you never have to go to the water store ever again. Um, the filters last pretty much forever. Um, and the water tastes amazing and is, you know, would be safe. So, if you live in Flint, Michigan, <laughs> uh, and you have kind of brownish water and you know lead laden water coming out of your um, uh, out of your you know um, the the water faucet, uh, I think anyone with kidney disease should really pay attention to the water uh, being super clean, no heavy metals in it, no nothing in it. Um, so I think it's money well spent to buy once and for all an RO system, reverse osmosis system and just go for that. Um, I think in the long run, it, it saves you a ton of money. Um, it's an initial investment. Okay, good, water, all right. So um, how about we move on to the next one, limit sugar intake. So my take is, <clears throat> you know, lots and lots of people, I see, you know, you go to the grocery store, you see what people have in their shopping carts, and they have sodas and juices we already talked about, they have candies and pastries and desserts and, lots of stuff with high fructose corn syrup. Um, they are all, you know, bad for kidneys, especially bad for polycystic kidneys because the sugar really is, you know, feeding the, um, the cysts. <clears throat> so we would recommend to try as much as possible to just not buy those, um, which I think ends up translating to saving a lot of money. Um, is it easy? Is it hard? I think it's hard for lots of people to just limit their sugar because sugar is also highly addictive. And, you know, if you eat, I think everybody knows this, you eat a muffin, um, you know, an hour later, you want another one and you're, you're craving more and more and more. Um, what's your take on, on sugar, Jess? 
Uh, yeah, so we tend to have a pretty sugar heavy diet in the sad, the sad diet. Most of the grocery, if we just talk on a money saving side of things. So <laughs> grocery stores make a lot of money on impulse purchases, mm -hmm. which is why at the checkout line, there's a lot of treats there. Um, as a mom with young kids, it's like the most torturous area to walk mm -hmm. through because my kids are like always wanting to grab stuff. I was like, no, 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 we're not, we're not buying anything today. But um, it, uh, yeah, so you definitely, if you're already working on that, and sometimes it's a process because also, you know, we want to recognize that while um, limiting and pulling back on that has huge health benefits. It doesn't even matter if you have kidney disease or not, like sure to have a ton of redeeming benefits other than it tastes good. <laughs> but if you're, if you're pulling back on that, there may be times where, you know, it comes as part of a celebration, you know, it's a birthday cake or something. There's places to fit it in wisely, but if it's part of your diet all the time, you get used to always having that in your diet, like always a sweet cereal at breakfast, always, you know, at lunch, you have a, a juice and that sort of thing. And I'd say like, as a very simple first step, <clears throat> it's just, it's just looking at uh, just those simple sugars, right? Just like soda, juice. Those are actually two that are pretty easy for people to start switching out of. And I actually don't love artificial sweeteners either. Uh, the aspartame and the uh, oh, super yeah. that can mm -hmm. damage your gut. Uh, so switching, you know, from soda and juice, maybe you're switching to like, uh, like a sparkling water instead. Um, or, you know, starting to switch out your, if you really like candies or donuts or whatever, you can switch those for something else. And I really love the, the principle of not leaving holes. So if it's something you love, find a replacement for right now that can make you feel better. Dietary holes are always going to get filled with something because there are habits and our patterns. So if you're used to grabbing a candy bar at the checkout line, maybe try one of the, there's a couple really good um, uh, keto bars that you can get. And maybe you start with that and they're whole foods. They don't have a ton of junk in them. I gave one to Thomas this weekend to try. I don't know if you liked it or if you tried it or not, but mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple brands that, and you know, you can grab that. Maybe that's your treat and you'll find something new to replace that old habit as you start cutting back. And over time, people will, you start to lose your taste for uh, those simple carbs and those sugars as you find more wholesome things to replace them with. So. Right. Yes, perfect. Totally agree with everything you said. And I think, you know, one can use this as, um, and, you know, to save money, <clears throat> I think, at the end of the day. Um, so, ka there you go. Um, save some more money. All right, uh, limit sodium. <clears throat> so, my take here is, um, okay, how do you limit sodium? Um, so, sodium means salt, you know, the, the table salt you, know, you add to your food. Um, obviously, if you just, you know, add use less table salt at home, that's not a huge savings, but here's where the big savings comes in. Um, most of the, or a lot of the um, <clears throat> sodium that people actually eat um, comes from restaurant, restaurant foods, right? And cafeteria foods and so on. So uh, if somebody kind of eats out frequently, you know, maybe you eat at the company cafeteria every day, um, or you like to, you know, go to a restaurant um, all the time. The the sort of secret trick of restaurants is they actually put a ton of salt into their food because it makes people think it tastes better. And then they give, you know, the restaurant a better Yelp review and they, you know, get more money. Um, so I think an easy way or a highly effective way of limit the sodium intake is to actually go out less. Um, or if you do go out, make sure you really, really, um, you know, pick those foods that are not high in salt, you know, some salads might be okay and so on. Um, um, but um, I think that's where a lot of the um, the salt comes from. Um, what, what do you think, Jess? Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, what they've studied this, it, a lot of it is from eating out. And I was actually just talking with uh, one of my patients today about this. How do, you, how do you work around the salt thing when you're eating out? A lot of it is like, for sure, don't have them salt your food. See if you can find like those saltier things, get them on the side so you can choose your portion size as well. 
and and that's really helpful but also i think on the same note uh eating out and the convenience of food already being prepared for us has become part of our lifestyle and it almost seems like such a pain and you know like i get it as a busy person <laughs> with like a young family and you know two organizations like i'm i'm busy so i i get that but giving a little bit of space in your life for like wholesome foods or being able to prepare something simple. You don't even have to cook a big meal and be, you know, a great chef, even if it's as simple as, um, you know, getting some, a salad together and packing some salad dressing on the side. Those are really smart ways that you can cut down on salt and it saves a ton of money, <laughs> a ton of money. Eating out less saves a ton, a ton of money. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that was actually a huge thing during the COVID epidemic, you know, pandemic, whatever, <clears throat> um, when all the restaurants were closed, right? So I know personally I saved a ton of money, you know, because even if you wanted to, you couldn't go out and eat out. Um, suddenly everyone in America and probably in, in many parts of the world had a lot more spending money. <laughs> so there's the proof <laughs> um, how to save money. Great. Um, all right, so next one on the list is decrease animal foods and increase plant foods. So kind of be more plant focused um, with the, the types of foods one eats. And um, I think <clears throat> that is an easy way also of, you know, saving money. Although, you know, it could also be neutral. I guess we gave it a neutral rating here because it, you know, just depends on what you eat. If somebody, however, you know, eats a steak every day and you know meat is actually pretty expensive i think this, there's an opportunity to save money here wouldn't you say Jess? yeah and i know this is probably <laughs> this is going on facebook this is probably one of the most controversial points <laughs> when mm -hmm. we talk about like what's a kidney smart diet uh the the point here is not eliminating all animals but mm -hmm. increasing i mean i'll say you'll i say this a bajillion times uh every time i give a talk it's not always about what you take out it's about what you're adding back in and by nature of increasing more plants in your diet you do cut back on meat naturally and meat is meat is quite pricey especially right now um for my patients that love and you know there's a place for it for some people it's really a good place other people they just don't tolerate it you know different strokes for different folks but one one uh strategy that we like to use if people still want to include you know some meat and that's important to them but they're cutting they're just decreasing it is we'll use what's called less meat meals so an example of a less meat meal would be something like stir fry where you have, maybe you're doing a chicken stir fry and you have a ton of vegetables. Maybe you put uh, like, so, and, um, I really like to put the sunflower seeds actually in my stir fry because they're crunchy, but you stir fry that all up. And then you have some chicken in there, but you might use like two chicken breasts for mm -hmm. six people because you just don't need very much and it's mixed in with everything else. And that's an example of a less, a less meat meal. We're using a little bit of meat because it, adds flavor into the meal, but everything else is bulked out with vegetables. Hmm. So, Good. And yeah, yeah that definitely so. cuts down on cost a <laughs> huge amount. So totally agree. Right. Yeah. Okay. Super. Um, number six, decrease carbohydrate intake. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I guess the title has changed. It was also kind of saying, you know, be in ketosis every once in a while. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a strict ketogenic diet. You know, some people like to do time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, this kind of thing. And, um, but so the, the idea is, you know, as you, you know, so the good old-fashioned, the bad old-fashioned food pyramid you know, that we used to have, um, the whole bottom, the giant chunk of, of the bottom of the food pyramid was all carbohydrates. Right? It was your grains, your bread and pasta and potatoes and um, rice and so on. Um, so the sad diet, the standard American diet actually has, you know, usually way more than 50% of the energy comes from carbohydrates. And those carbohydrates turn into sugar, into blood sugar, um, and are at the end of the day, not great for our, for, you know, people's kidneys. Um, so, what happens, however, if you turn this around and you just limit the carbohydrate 
Um, and maybe you're in ketosis, uh, which is sort of the opposite of burning carbs. Uh, so you're actually burning fat. Um, um, what I think a lot of people have noticed, including me, you know, I've I've been my own guinea pig and I've done all these different dietary changes that we'll, I've been talking about, um, just so I know what, what I'm talking about. Um, if you're in ketosis, um, in, in my experience, is it really um, gives you a lot of satiety, so you're actually not hungry. Uh, very much um, and um, the opposite happens if somebody eats high carb meals a lot um, because the carbs get burned very quickly and you're hungry again very quickly um, so you know you eat your cornflakes for breakfast and a couple of hours later you're you know so hungry that you have to eat a snack and then you get hungry again you have to eat your lunch and, and so on if you're reducing your carbs and instead you know eat more healthy fats and more protein potentially um that turns everything around and you're not hungry as much as what do you think about that jess yeah i mean yeah um and more fiber fiber is a really fiber, key, right. a key piece here yeah i mean i i think that there is you know and again you find which piece is going to work for you. But if you look at your diet and you're like, oh, like breakfast tends to be a fairly carb heavy meal on like a traditional American diet because it's based on uh, cereal or pancakes or waffles or like muffins or egg McMuffins or that sort of thing. So it can be a pretty carb heavy diet, a lot of or carb heavy start to your day. Maybe you just start there and you say, hmm, like, maybe I could look at some new ideas. Like what are some ketogenic breakfasts that people are doing and not saying you have to start with ketosis or sometimes we'll use a diabetic websites and we'll say like, what are their lower carb breakfasts that they're using? And is there something pretty close that I could utilize? You know, my, uh, one of my favorite breakfasts in the morning is a smoothie. And so for me, as I was cutting down carbs in my life, I was like, oh, but I love like a couple of bananas in my smoothie. It makes it really creamy, really sweet. And I was swapping out for, I use a little bit of cauliflower now, and then I still like mine to be a little bit sweet. So I use a couple drops of stevia, but you can find a swap for whatever you're doing to start bring down those carbs as well. And I will say, on like a cost standpoint, this is the place where people can really start bumping their costs up in their diet. Because what what we see, and you know, you're just kind of balancing this with where you want to be. But people say, I eat bread. And so and I like having a sandwich. And so an easy switch for me is to switch to keto bread. <laughs> and keto breads are often quite expensive, unless they're a really, really poor quality. And so that's where people can see some of their costs increase if they're trying to find the same processed product mm. in a ketogenic form. And sometimes that's what you do. Like you find something that works for you and it makes the diet doable and it's good. Sometimes you find something that is easy to meal prep. And we'll talk a lot. If you come into Renew, you spend a little bit of time meal prepping patients that we work with. Like, can you plan for at least like 30 to 60 minutes a week just to meal prep for the week? So it makes a big difference. Sometimes it's making flax bread, which is literally like three ingredients and you mix it up and you put it in the oven or making your own flax cracker. Those things really help cut costs down if you make it yourself, if you have the time, if you don't have the time, but you have the money. And then sometimes you buy a product that's a good product. Mm -hmm. Good. Excellent. Yeah. And I think, you know, if somebody does time restricted eating this thing here, for example, what you start eating in the morning, at, you know, at 11 a.m. and you finish at 7, 7 p.m. So it's an eight hour window of eating. Uh, and then outside of that window, you don't eat. Um, I've done this. Um, it's kind of sort of become my lifestyle a little bit. Um, I find um you actually get away with eating two meals only, right? So um, for me, it actually saves a ton of money. Um, I don't know, you know, there's no snacks really in between necessarily. Um, so anyway, I think there's a chance of um, not spending at least more money and, you know, potentially saving money. Um, number seven and eight um, are sort of somewhat related. So you want to avoid these um, renal stressors, such as these phosphate, food additives um, and oxalate. You know, they come from totally different things. So the phosphate food additives are in 
all these processed foods. Um, and, you know, if you look at your favorite grocery store, just randomly pull processed foods off the shelf and, and, and you look at the food label, chances are maybe like half of them at least have, you know, these different things in them, dicalcium phosphate, monosodium phosphate, and so on. So anything with phos, um, cutting that down means cutting down on these processed foods and buying, you know, whole foods instead, which I think can cut down costs. Um, what do you think, Jess? Oops, are we there? Sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. But yeah, when you work towards a whole foods diet, you mm -hmm. find that there are, you know, some things you pay a little bit more for um, that maybe you weren't purchasing before, which is why people go for like, it costs more like, oh, like I'm buying like more produce than I used to. And at first, you know, you might start, <laughs> you might, you might not be managing your produce well and you're like, oh, it goes to waste. I, you know, was spending more, more, more money than I used to. But then you learn the skills over time on how you manage putting more of those whole foods, more of that produce in your life and it doesn't cost you so much. So yeah, the, and you know, part of that is you're reducing the, those additives in your food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Um, and uh, maybe one important thing to, to talk about is, um, you know, a kidney healthy diet along those lines we were just looked at. Um, doesn't mean <clears throat> everything has to be organic and, you know, locally sourced and so on. You know, of course, that's always better, um, I suppose, if, if, you know, if the budget is there. Mm -hmm. But if the budget isn't there, I think it is completely fine to just pick the non-organic versions of whatever it is um and um even you know dollar stores you know i've made it a little bit of a fun game for myself to actually browse through dollar stores and see if i could possibly find things there that are actually healthy <clears throat> and you absolutely can um, i think you could feed a, a large family easily by going to a dollar store and you know buying the stuff they have um, but you have to know what you're doing and have to know what to look for and, you know, how to read the food labels and how to reject all the, the junk that they also sell and find the good things. Um, so I think start out with, you know, the not organic things and don't go to the fancy grocery stores. Um, go to the cheap ones. Um, what do you think about that, Jess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I thought I actually prepared prepared a few tools that we use oh, when you're sorry. looking at yeah, uh, just a few online places that have helped me kind of cut my cost down a little bit. When mm -hmm. I look at that, it doesn't, you don't have to be totally organic. And again, like it's so easy to look at a list of eight and say, ah, oh, that feels overwhelming, but you pick one. I mean, everyone can drink a little bit more water. Um, you know, most people could say, oh, maybe I'll skip my regular donut that we do. Or, you know, there's there's little things that you can make that don't cost a lot of money to do. But I just thought I'd share a couple things oh. uh, that would be pretty easy. And then we'll be moving into questions here in a second. So um, I'm just going to share my screen here. But one thing that I use is I do like to use some of the online markets when I'm buying something that I use regularly because I find that they're often less expensive here or the same expense <laughs> as different grocery stores. So, for example, I really like to use VitaCost, which is kind of the, um, the healthy uh, shop. It's run by um, the same organization that does Kroger and... Uh, oh man, I don't know what it is on the, on the West coast, on the East coast, it's Kroger, but it's all this like massive grocery store company. But these are nice because sometimes you're looking for something in particular, you're just trying something new and you can look through some of the different products that are out there and find something that will work for you. Now, one thing just to note when you're looking at new products here is that um a lot of keto label products can have quite a few almonds in them so i just mm. always say to watch out for that but you know for me um if i'm going to use like a really clean mayonnaise i don't do good with soy oil so i don't use it personally it's a lot cheaper for me to buy it here than in my store which is almost ten dollars for a similar product mm. um 
And then Thrive Market is another online grocer that has some, you know, good quality products. This one I can vary. Sometimes you get really amazing deals and sometimes you don't, but this is another one I use. The other place that I've found that's really helpful, and let me stop sharing here. And this again, like the dollar store is your quest. Aldi's is my quest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Aldi's near them. Aldi's actually has a lot of good, like lower carbohydrate food and good quality food that's not so expensive as some of the food that you would buy for a premium, <laughs> like, uh, you know, some of the higher end grocery stores. So whenever I go to Aldi's, I'll always, uh, I'll always look for some of the lower carbohydrate foods and, you know, check out the ingredients and see if it would work. And I always feel like I've struck gold if I find a new product that we can use with our, use with our patients. Um, but those are, you know, just a couple of grocery stores. Mm -hmm. uh, places you can source things if you have something that's regularly included in your diet and it's costing you a bundle. <laughs> Sometimes mm -hmm. you can use the online market. Right. Those are great tips. Um, and, you know, Aldi is actually a German <laughs> grocery store. That's where it comes from. And, um, you know, I didn't grow up in a wealthy family at all. And we were actually, when I was a kid, you know, that's where my family shopped at Aldi's. Um, and now they have it here in the US, um, you know, probably not everywhere, but you know, at least um, yeah, around in, in some places. Um, there's one thing, um, you know, there's this YouTuber, um, Thomas DeLauer, maybe some people might know about him. You can, everyone can look him up. He has these um, interesting videos where he goes through different grocery stores, you know, with, with someone with a camera following him. And he just looks at, um, you know, what is the good stuff uh, that they have, you know, and um, he, he has a, you know, goes to Aldi's, the Costco, um, even the dollar store and, and so on. Um, so um, I made it a little game for the family also to, you know, I watched this Aldi thing um, and kind of wrote down all the, the stuff he recommends and, and you know, found it in, in the store and, and bought it and you know, it wasn't very much money. So anyway. Good. So I think we talked about a whole bunch of tips that might hopefully help some people to um, save some money and still have a, a good diet. Um, do we have questions? Let's see. I'm not sure how to. Oh, there's a question that popped us up. Um, I'm a person with a normal BMI. Can I follow a ketogenic diet? Ah, what do you think, Jess? Yeah, we have lots and lots of very active people, very fit people, people that are like, I don't want to lose any weight. And, you know, they can follow a ketogenic diet. Um, you just, it's about just getting your calories set just right. And some, there's usually a little bit of a learning curve. So a lot of people lose a little bit weight initially, then you can stabilize it and get to where you know how many right. calories you need to have on board, where your macros are at, are you like too far in ketosis? So there's some things you can refine. You're doing it on your own. It's a great, at least do it a one-time appointment with a professional to kind of hone in on what you'd be aiming for so you don't lose extra mm -hmm. weight. Right, yeah. And I think, um, Jai wrote, that, that's actually a great question. Um, you can sort of tune a ketogenic diet to either lose weight or actually gain weight or, you know, stay the same. Um, and um, I know a lot of people accidentally gain weight, <laughs> you know, because they like the fat so much. Um, um, and others said, um, you know, so if you if you do it wrong, um, maybe the bottom line is measure your body weight, right? So have a scale at home and just make sure, you know, you don't go in, in, in the wrong direction. If you do go in the wrong direction, uh, you'd want to adjust uh, most likely the fat intake um, because that's the easiest way you can go overboard, right? With, yeah. Um, okay. I think it's a great question. Let's see. There's another one, Captain Steve. <clears throat> Hi, Captain Steve. Um, what's your latest general guideline for macronutrient ratio for people that stay in keto? What do you think, Jess? So uh, we do about 70 to 80% of our calories from fat, and then depending on the person, 10 to 15 from protein and 10 to 15 from carb. And it's like those, what we tell all our patients, this is our ballpark. <laughs> we're going to start here. Then we're going to see what, like how this goes for the next couple of weeks. And then we'll hone it and refine it down uh, to what your macros need to be. So 
so but yeah that's mm -hmm. what that's about where we start per person and again it changes based on their stage some people that have a lot more kidney function they have more wiggle room with you know flexing that protein part whereas people with less kidney function we find they need to be a little bit more careful with it so it just really depends on the person and if you exercise a bunch you have a little bit more carb flexibility um but yeah good super <clears throat> let's see oh ian mcmain hi ian <clears throat> um how would you rank the eight habits uh in terms of most impactful oh yeah okay well that's a hard one you know of course, there are no clinical trials that have been done to compare one against the other, against the next, against the next. You know, these kind of trials would just be costing hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so this will probably, honestly, never be done to, you know, with scientific accuracy to say water is more important than reducing salt or than phosphate. So I think we will never quite know. Um, I always think of it in terms of you know you try to layer benefits on top of each other <clears throat> as much as you can um if you can only do one thing you know do the one thing if you do one thing and you know you think you're ready for the next at the next and, and so on so i think the more the better where would i start um you know i'm biased probably you know i would probably say start with the easiest thing and and start with keto citra um just because that that's has pretty much no impact on on you know the, the life <laughs> uh, habits you know you just drink um, a couple of drinks every day um does it have the highest impact um i would probably think yes but you know i wouldn't i don't know for sure um well what do you think what 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 would you how would you rank those you know those kind of that's a super good question i I think for me, and we say this, the worst diet is the one you can't follow. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think in most impactful is the thing you are going to be consistent with the most to start. And that is going to be the most impactful for you because it would be the most consistent. But as far as like which habit is the number one thing that makes the biggest change, I it is... Uh, pink is so different for every single person it it really is and i think the more that you look at the research we just came back from pink Eddy update and this thought came up a lot it's it's just so different for every person on how you know the gene end up manifesting and you know the different impacts on it in different ways i i think you can't say that one habit is most impactful for everybody i think there's different habits that could be really impactful for different mm -hmm of people but right. yeah it's definitely as a starting like sim simplistically it's the one you're going to be most consistent with first that you feel like can give you some momentum yeah and that's a really good point you know if you can't stick with it then it's useless um so pick something you think you can can stick with and and do it and then move on to the next one yeah, yeah absolutely but, but i will say <laughs> just like one like maybe this is a minute correction it's not useless to start something and stop it you learn things about yourself it's useless if you stop trying right. so if you start something it doesn't go so well like you try a lot of people and i know for sure myself the first couple of times trying a ketogenic diet like it didn't work for me i didn't get ketosis i didn't plan well blah blah, blah. but I learned what I needed to learn and it was really helpful for me personally and as a clinician to be like oh like that was tough for me so let me try again and see what will happen next time. And uh, it's too easy in a place of fear to beat yourself up and be like, oh, like I tried it and didn't work. Or like, oh man, I fell off the bandwagon today. Uh, shoot, like now the worst thing will happen. It's better if you just say, hey, like that is to be human. <laughs> so I'll just, I want to try again. So I'll just try again tomorrow. And what did I learn from it? Mm -hmm. So. Great. I actually see a comment there, another comment from Captain Steve. I don't know how to get it on the screen. Captain Steve says, I do all eight steps and have had uh, great results. Thanks for saying that, Captain Steve. Mm. Um, good, super. And actually, we hear this all the time, you know, from people that have um, either gone through the Renew program or have kind of followed, you know, the um, 
the Facebook group of the long name. Uh, what's this called again? PKD Nutrition and Oxalate. Oh, PKD Nutrition, yeah. <laughs> PKD Nutrition and a bunch of other things. So <clears throat> if you're following that um, Facebook group, I think you'll learn a, a ton by just you know, looking at all the discussions there. Yeah. Good, super. Let's see what else we have. Um, all right, uh, Gyro. Um, again, thank you for your comment. Uh, greetings. I have um, uh, diagnosed with been diagnosed with ADPKD. If my serum potassium is a little high, um, what kind of healthy fats consume? Um, if I want to follow a low carb diet, I'm not totally sure. I get this. I got Maybe. it. I got, you got it. it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. If your potassium is running a little bit high, probably some of that is really can't. You're like, ah, oh, but I can't do avocados because I got a ton of potassium, and that's one of the good healthy fats. So what else can I do? Mm -hmm. uh, so to answer the question simplistically, a lot of the uh, things that are pure fat, like olive oil, coconut oil, um, oil like in a fish, those things, you know, they don't have a lot of potassium in them. Something like coconut butter would have a lot of potassium in it, but the pure fats don't. When you have a fat combined in a food, uh, there's some high potassium sources there. You know, coconut cream, avocados are two good sources. So on a simplistic side, I mean, we really try and be heavy on um, olive oil in particular because it's so high in polyphenols. And that one, you know, doesn't have potassium in it. So you could use that. The other thing, though, that I will say, because this is a huge misconception, is that potassium is not entirely driven by diet. And the more and more you look at the research behind it, you'll see that diet isn't the main driver. It doesn't mean you don't have to be conscientious, but it does mean that having a conversation with your dietitian or your physician, like, hey, what are some contributing factors to my potassium being high, blood pressure meds? being, you know, acidotic, mm. uh, those things can also drive potassium. So we'll always say like, solve, like control the diet first till you figure out what else is driving potassium. Once you've figured out the driver of potassium, then you can liberalize your diet. And I will say the other thing is a lot of times you can still fit in some of those high potassium foods in some proportion, like even if it's half an avocado. Great, super answers. And maybe just let one thing to sprinkle in there. <clears throat> um, potassium has this bad rep for kidney disease. And I think a lot of that is based on misinformation. So potassium is actually good for kidneys. So the kidneys love potassium. And most people in the US don't get enough potassium. Um, so including a lot of kidney patients and they're actually kind of somewhat deficient in their potassium. And they need, if anything, to increase their potassium. Um, but it only goes to a certain point. So if one gets closer and closer to kidney failure and the kidneys can't handle the potassium properly, um, that that's when things kind of flip around. Um, so that's why it's important to um, for everyone to talk to their doctor, figure out where they stand with their potassium levels in their blood, um, and um, you know choose their diet accordingly. Good. Excellent. Do we have any other questions? Captain Steve again. All right. Thank you, Captain Steve. <clears throat> um, what do you think about coconut flour? And what about omega-3 and 6 ratios for fats? Wow. That's a great question for you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so coconut flour can be a useful ingredient. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing at this question because I inherited a couple bags of coconut flour from my mom and I just don't like the taste. Like I've tried a bajillion things to cook with it and I have not found the recipe yet that makes something I really like. And I like coconut, but I just don't like things I make with coconut flour. I don't know, <laughs> but it can work really good in a ketogenic diet. And if you look through um, some of the ketogenic recipes where they're making a bread or, you know, like some sort of a bakery item, they'll use coconut flour. And so some people have great success. <laughs> you cannot substitute it like any alternative flour, one for one for wheat flour, for sure, coconut flour, it'd be like, it tastes awful. It'd be very, very dry. It just soaks up moisture. Um, so that's one thing to think about. And then on omega-3, 6 ratios for fat is definitely something that you consider uh, when you're following a ketogenic diet. So mm -hmm. on like where are your ratios for fat? And that's where it can be really nice to track your uh what you're eating for a little while and see where you're heavy on three to six or nine omegas 
and uh, balance it out, uh, preferably first with food, if not with a supplement. Mm -hmm. Great. And, you know, the omega-6 fats and oils, you know, they're the more inflammatory ones. <clears throat> um, and that includes, unfortunately, all the cheap things, <laughs> right? So the canola oil and sunflower and soya oil and so on. And they happen to be in everything, but in all the processed foods. And of course, the food industry um, <laughs> cuts costs, but so they use the cheap oils. And, and those are all the high omega-6 oils, um, which tend to be more inflammatory. Um, so I think it's, you know, you know, a little bit important to, to start paying attention to that um, and try to figure out what types of oils and fats um, to not necessarily include in the, in the diet and which ones to include. Um, and, you know, I know it's a Renew program, you know, you, you guys are very into things like olive oil and avocado oil and, you know, even butter and things like that, um, you know, which have um, like a really good ratio there. Great. All right. Um, let's see. Are we almost done with questions or do we have more? Um, let's see. We might be. Um, can a person eat starchy? Okay. Somebody asked, um, can a person with PKD eat starchy vegetables? That's uh, Gyro, Gyro, maybe? Yeah, that's um, a great question on YouTube. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, so you, you can, right. There are foods that can definitely fit with a starchy vegetable. Some of the traditional starchy vegetables, uh, like potatoes can have a pretty heavy oxalate content if you're eating them with the skin in particular. Um, so you can, you can eat them. If your goal is ketosis, it's a little bit harder to fit them in. And so you're, you know, kind of considering how you would put them in, but, you know, for example, we're preparing, a lot of our fall recipes right now and as dietitians every dietitian that has a cohort and we're new we take a recipe and try it and so we have a couple like pumpkin soups um and butternut squash and like some of those uh starchier squash vegetables that we're trying out this round because they can work pretty good in a ketogenic diet mm -hmm. so it just it really depends I, it, that's a pretty broad question it's like uh, the answer depends on where you're at in your journey and which ones in particular you're meeting. If you mean starch in general, yeah, you can fit it in if you're not aiming for ketosis and just kind of a lower carbohydrate approach. Right. Okay. Yeah. But definitely for a keto type of diet, you know, starchy foods are bad um, because they will kick you out of ketosis. Um, you know, if you're, you know, it's easy to get over that limit there. All right. Um, actually, there's another great question from uh, Jairo. Um, thanks for all those questions. Um, the fructose of the fruits, is it harmful for the kidneys with ADPKD? I take at start with this one. <laughs> um, so fructose in, is actually interesting. Um, as you know, some people might know um, the table sugar, you know, the sucrose um, is actually um, a two molecules stuck together. One molecule is the glucose, the other one is fructose. So half of the table sugar is actually fructose. Um, and the, um, the sugar in most fruit is pretty high in fructose as well. And fructose is a funky one, um, not necessarily super healthy um, because it um, raises your uric acid levels. Um, <clears throat> so uric acid is one of these things um, that the kidneys are in charge of excreting. And um, they can have a hard time doing that and they can get damaged in the process. Um, so you don't want high uric acid levels. And fructose, unfortunately, is one of these factors in the diet um, that raises, that increases uric acid levels. Um, so I would say for someone with kidney disease and PKD, you'd want to be um, aware of fructose and aware is it in and try to minimize that. Um, it's also can be potentially harmful for the liver um, because the liver is the only organ in the body that can really metabolize fructose and it essentially turns it into fat um, and that can cause uh, or contribute to fatty liver disease so that's also not a good thing um, so i would say fructose is one of the kind of offenders uh, in, in in diet um, and you know unfortunately you know you all, hear this all the time but eat more fruits and vegetables you know fruits and vegetables 
you don't really need to eat more fruit. Uh, but fruit are kind of like candy, you know, nature's candy. And um, eat more vegetables, yes. Eat more fruit. Uh, I'd be very careful with that. What, what, what's your take, Jess? <laughs> I uh, disagree with you a little bit. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, I'm a food. I, I mean, excessive amounts of fruit for sure. Yeah. Excessive of anything is going to be harmful. But there is uh, when you're looking at a whole food in particular. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're aiming for ketosis, it's hard to include a lot of fruit just because you has <laughs> to with carbohydrates. Um, but if you're not aiming for ketosis and you're kind of a lower carbohydrate diet, there's certainly a place for those whole, those whole fruits um, that can work really well for some people. And, you know, certainly I would say like a piece of fruit would be better than a candy bar. Um, and I, I personally don't, I feel like fructose versus high fructose, like fructose at a whole fruit where there's fiber and lots of other vitamins and minerals is very different than high fructose corn syrup. And so piecing out that I, I think is important, but um, I mean, excessive amounts of fruits, is not good for anyone, but we do. I mean, just with kidney disease, I have met many people that eat fruit, a whole fruits, a whole foods diet, and they do quite well. Um, and with PKD, again, it's just like where, what is your goal with your carbohydrates to sort out, would that work for you in particular? So, mm -hmm. and I, I would hate to demonize fruit as a whole for PKD because I think it can work for some people and have some really good nutrients uh, that can work for them. Okay. Well. well, how about we compromise? What are some of the fruits that are kind of lower in sugar <clears throat> and that you actually use in the Renew program? Yeah, so we use, uh, we like to use some of the berries in particular. Berries have a little bit of a lower carb and they're like have tons of really amazing antioxidants. So we really like to use uh, some of the berries as well. And uh, so that's one that we use. Sometimes we use a little bit of pineapple. Um, we have a couple of pineapple recipes that work really good. Pineapple's got a really good, strong flavor. So, um, so we put it in some smoothies and our patients love that because they really miss that kind of citrusy mm -hmm. taste. And so it's, like such a treat for them okay good yeah so i <clears throat> i actually love those frozen blueberries you know just a little secret tip there costco has them that's why i buy them but yeah. i'm sure other shops have them too um you know it's frozen it lasts forever you just pull some out a handful and throw it in some yogurt or something and um i think the fructose content is not super high um so i would put my stamp of approval on blueberries all right Good. So I think we're at the hour, at the top of the hour, and um, we've had some great questions. Um, maybe we'll stop here and um, try to do this again uh, in a couple of weeks or so <clears throat> when we have a chance. Yeah, we'd love to know what topics people would want to hear a little bit more about. We do kind of very broad. Maybe there's something specific we can hone in on and questions. That would be great. Uh, feedback for us as well perfect yeah so everyone please okay. comment down there you know down there somewhere um you 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 know the topics you wish us to talk about um so just put them all down there the more the merrier and then that gives us kind of a list to accumulate and then we'll do it great okay i would say have a great evening everyone all right nice to meet you all thank you jess good thank to you. see you again yep all thanks right. for having me we'll see you bye-bye bye-bye